Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this lecture, we are going to be discussing the, the genetic code. This is very important because it makes up a huge basis of the upcoming lectures and the discussions we're going to have as it pertains to medicine. Don't forget to subscribe to our account because your support means a lot to us. It allows us to keep these lectures free of charge so that you don't have to pay a single dime and go into more debt. With that being said, let's dive right in by first discussing DNA. DNA is very important. I'm sure you know that you know that by now, and I'm sure I don't need to go too deep into it, but we need to get an overview view of what DNA is. DNA is essentially your genetic code. Now I wish I could stop this lecture right here and I wouldn't have to go on and it would be super easy, but that's not the case. We need to dive a little bit deeper. DNA is generally located in the nuclei of, of our eukaryotic cells. Now this isn't always the case. For example, in your mitochondria, you have DNA in there called your mitochondrial DNA. But in terms of our genetic code and how genes play a role in our body and in terms of cellular processes, the DNA that we're discussing is going to always be located in the the nuclei. In terms of DNA itself, DNA is a polymer of nucleotides. And nucleotides are very, very important because they're composed of three main things. We have nucleotides right here, okay? So nucleotides are composed of number one, a sugar backbone. This is your ribose sugar. This structure is going to give us the backbone of our DNA. Essentially, it is going to give us the main structure or the spine or the, the skeletal process, right? The, it's going to give us the structure that our DNA has. If you look right here in this photo, you can see this double helix. Before you see the double helix, you can see each strand actually has a simple uh, stru I don't know what else to say other than structure. This structure is possible because of the ribose sugar. Then you also have a nitrogenous base that is going to be connected to the, uh, the sugar backbone or this structure right here. The reason why these bases are important is because this is essentially a binding point that allows two strands of DNA to bind to each other. Also, these bases are important because they are part of our genetic code and they are very important for our genetic code because they play a vital role in determining what a certain gene is or what it looks like or what the code for a certain gene or a certain protein is. Okay, and you can see the nitrogenous bases right here. These colorful structures in this picture are the nitrogenous bases and they bind to each other to create the double helix structure that you probably know about, you know, in terms of DNA. So these are the nitrogenous bases when you see this image, the lines that are connecting these two strands. All right, and then finally, you have a phosphate group right here. Now, the main thing you also need to remember is in terms of a ribonucleotide and a deoxyribonucleotide, you need to know what the difference between these two structures are because nucleotides are very, very important, and it's very easy, easily uh, confused between a deoxyribonucleotide and a ribonucleotide. So ribonucleotides are found in RNA and deoxyribonucleotides are found in DNA. And the main differentiating factor between the two is this carbon right here in the ribose group. As you can see in the DNA or the deoxyribonucleotide, you are missing an OH group that is present in the ribonucleotide in this carbon. That is the main difference. Make sure you understand that. Okay, so with that being said, let's dive a little bit deeper now and let's talk about these nitrogenous bases. These nitrogenous bases are very important and there are five bases you need to know. Two of these bases are classified as purines and those two bases are adenine and guanine, as you can see right here. This is the structure of adenine, this is the structure of guanine. And purines have a two-ring structure, okay? Purines are two-ringed. And Pyrimidines, which are the other type of bases, and there are three of them, are actually single ringed. And there are three main pure, uh, three main pyrimidines: cytosine, thymine, and uracil. And these structures are very important because these are going to determine what type of binding you're going to have. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about that by discussing our DNA base pairing and the binding that occurs. So the DNA bases are going to connect to each other, but they're not going to connect randomly to each other. They're going to connect directly to a specific, uh, a specific purine or pyrimidine. So this is what DNA base pairing looks like. Number one, you have adenine. Adenine is going to always bind to thymine right here. Okay. So A always bind to T. And then guanine will always bind to cytosine. 
And this is very important. The reason why this is very important is because with guanine and cytosine, you have three bonds. That means that any position or any sequence that has a high level of, of or a high number of guanine and cytosine uh, uh, binding sites or guanine and cytosine um, essentially like coding means that this is going to be a strong sequence. What, is, what does that mean? How does that apply to our human body? How does it apply to medicine? Well, think of it this way. You, UV light can break DNA and it can cause a lot of structural damage to DNA. Now, if you have a portion of DNA that has a lot of guanine cytosine binding uh, you know, sites or they have a lot of guanine and cytosine in their genetic code, that portion is going to be very safe and it's going to be more secure than other parts of the genetic code that do not have guanine and cytosine. That's that's why it's important. So keep that in mind. Now, this is the DNA base pairs. When it comes to RNA, it's a little bit different because we haven't talked about this molecule right here, uracil. Uracil is only found in RNA. So when it comes to RNA, the binding site for uracil is going to be adenine. Every time you have an adenine, it's going to bind to uracil. If you have a thymine as well, it will also bind to adenine. But in RNA, uracil will bind to adenine. And then guanine and cytosine is going to be the same no matter what. Now, when it comes to the structure of DNA, and when it comes to the structure of the nitrogenous bases, you have to remember that the structure is anti-parallel. That means one of these strands is going to be going in the five prime to three prime, you know, uh, three prime way. And if you look right here, that is this strand right here. So I'm going to draw an arrow going to 5 to 3. And the other strand is going to be anti-parallel, meaning it's going to be going in the other, other direction, which is going to be the 3 prime to 5 prime, which all is coming from the perspective of this region, from the top down. So that means it gets going 3 prime to 5 prime. Now, if you are looking from the bottom up, this strand is actually 5 prime to 3 prime, and this is 3 prime to 5 prime. It's a little confusing, so you need to understand and you need to be able to orient yourself in terms of what portion or what way you are looking at the genetic code. But always remember, DNA goes from 5 prime to 3 prime, okay? 5 to 3 is the way to be. That's how I always remembered it, so... Is the way to be. Okay, now that we've discussed the nitrogenous bases and we have a good understanding of DNA, let's talk about the features of the genetic code because your genetic code is very important. It is a very, very high yield topic that you need to now remember and these next four features that we're going to be discussing, you cannot forget. You will be tested on this multiple times throughout your career in medicine. So the first feature of the genetic code is that it is unambiguous. Very, very important. The reason why we say this is because the genetic code essentially codes for a protein at the end of the day. That's what it goes to, right? You have DNA, which your genetic code is located in. It is going to be coded into RNA, and each RNA molecule will then become a type of protein. Very important. Well, what are proteins made up of? They are essentially made up of amino acids. And amino acids are then coded by, right here, your genetic code. And that is something that is... Uh, unambiguous. Okay, so what does that actually mean? Essentially, it means that each codon is specific for only for one amino acid. Does that make sense? Each codon is specific for only an amino acid. That's it. That I want to just make very clear. So that is very, very important. It is uh, unambiguous. The only aspect of the genetic code that does not have any exception is this, this aspect, okay? The unambiguous aspect. So what does that really mean? That means that AUU will always lead to isoleucine. That means that when you have a uracil, a cytosine, and a uracil in order, it will always lead to serine. This code will always go there. It doesn't mean that this code can then become leucine or proline or anything like that. That does not happen. What an unambiguous means is that this structure, UCU, will always go to serine. UCC will always go to the amino acid serine. UCC. UCA, UCG always leads to serine, okay? 
That is very, very important. And that is the first uh, concept you need to remember. The second concept is that your genetic code is able to be redundant and is also degenerate. What does that mean at the end of the day? Most amino acids are coded by multiple codons, as you can see right here. This codon, and if you don't know, if you haven't figured it out by now, a codon is essentially a sequence of three nitrogenous bases, okay? So if it is a uracil, a cytosine in a uracil, or three uracils in a row right here, or a cytosine, ad adenine, and uracil, whatever it is, three nitrogenous bases, in a row is a codon and each codon in this concept uh, or in this feature of the genetic code is going to be leading to one specific uh, amino acid but one amino acid can be built or can be you know uh, led up to by multiple codons that means most of the amino acids are actually coded by multiple codons that gives us more ability now the exception to this is the amino acids uh, methionine and tryptophan they only have one codon so if you look really closely right here is tryptophan it is only coded by ugg and methionine which is the start codon is only coded by aug if i were you by the way i would remember a u g very well because this is the start codon this is going to be always uh the codon that you're going to see when the genetic code is being replicated or when a protein is being created all right that is very very important especially for your learning processes how do you remember that well it's very simple most schools in uh in the united states especially when it comes to college tend to start in august or i just think about a school beginning in august and if that is the first uh you know month of the school year well it starts in August, A-U-G are the first three letters, therefore think of August as the beginning of school year. Okay, pretty straightforward. Now, the important part about this concept is that there is a very important position in the codon. There is a very important position because this position allows us to have a lot of variability in our genetic code. And that position is called the wobble position, the third position of the codon. So let's say you have codon position A, B, and C. Okay, remember we said that three nitrogenous bases a, a, in a row make up a codon. Well, this third position right here is the wobble position. The reason why it is the wobble position is because it, variations in this position may or may not lead to a different amino acids. That means if this uh, if this position right here is coded by another amino acid, you still have a high probability that it can still lead to the intended amino acid that we wanted. So let's take a look at phenyl. Uh, Phenylalanine. Phenylalanine is produced by the codon UUU, three U's in a row, right? Three uracils. But what happens if the third uracil gets changed into cytosine? Well, amazingly so, we are able to continue producing phenylalanine. Same thing with leucine. If the third codon or the third position in this codon is a adenine, but it gets transcribed or it gets changed to a guanine, it can still produce leucine. And if you look right here, the main difference between majority of the uh, codons right here is that the third position is the one that is really changing. The first two do not change because if you change the first two positions, you cannot reach the final intended amino acid that we are looking for. Very, very important. So the wobble position, high yield high yield concept, something you need to recall, something you need to remember, and something you will be tested on when it comes to biochemistry. So now we have talked about the unambiguous aspect, which means that each codon or a specific codon will lead to one specific amino acid. What that means is that one, three, uh, three, nitrogenous bases in a row or a triplet of nitrogenous bases will only lead to a specific type of amino acid. The second feature is that this is a very redundant process. Even though one codon leads to one amino acid, an amino acid is not only coded by one codon. An amino acid can be coded by multiple types of codons. Okay, 
the third concept of this, uh, the third feature of the genetic code is that this genetic code, our genetic code is commonless and is overlapping. That means that the genetic code is always read from a fixed starting point. Usually that fixed starting point is going to be AUG, which is the start codon. And when you do it from that starting point, it is going to be read as a continuous base. When we are transcribing, it is going to be read continuously. Now, some viruses don't function that way, and that is the exception to the genetic code. Some viruses have multiple starting points. Their genetic code doesn't just start from one point and end to the at end where it's supposed to be. It might have multiple stop and start uh, codons. So it will start, it will stop. There may be a portion that doesn't get transcribed. It will then start again and then stop again. That's very important. And then finally, the last thing you need to know about your genetic code is that it is universal. The genetic code is conserved throughout time. It is found in every single, essentially, human being. And majority of the genes we know are coded by more or less the same uh, uh, nitrogenous bases. We know that. And that's why it's universal. The only exception is going to be the mitochondria in humans. Mitochondria in humans can have variations because they are passed down from, it's only the mother. And on top of that, these are essentially the eukaryotic cells or prokaryotic cells that were combined into two, uh, two prokaryotic, prokaryotic cells combined themselves. And that's how we have a mitochondria intracellularly. If you are, you know, up to date on the concept of cell theory, you will remember this. But essentially, the mitochondria is the exception to the universal feature of the genetic code. So what are the three, uh, oh, sorry, what are the four features of the genetic code? Number one, we have the concept of an un unambiguity it is unambiguous number 2 this is a very redundant process redundant number 3 this is a commaless process meaning it is read through and through and number 4 it is universal what you have in terms of genetic code is essentially what I have, and the way it functions is exactly the same. Our genes are coded by the same nitrogenous bases. So with that being said, we have covered the basis or the basic concepts of the genetic code. I hope this was helpful. If it was, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more content. And if you want to see additional educational content for your learning purposes, all for free, go to our website, www.myadmedicine.org, where we're releasing new content online every single day. Thank you.